understand the nature of these relics, we can start in a city where I spend a lot of time. The modern capital of Egypt, Cairo. Today, Cairo is over 90% Muslim. But there was a time over a thousand years ago when it was largely Christian. This is an area called Coptic Cairo. These narrow lanes and ornate churches are all that's left of what was once a sprawling Christian urban center. One of the earliest Christian churches in the area, Abu Serga, houses a fairly typical Christian relic. In popular culture, most people think of relics as any ancient or precious object. But strictly speaking, a relic is the preserved flesh and bone of a sacred being. In this case, the sacred being is Saint Bashnuna. This velvet casing actually holds his bodily remains. Like many Christian saints, Bashnuna was a martyr. He's thought to have been burned alive by Muslims in the year 1164. Egyptian Christians believe that contact with what's left of his body provides healing, renewed faith, and guidance. Why is so much power attributed to certain bodily remains? And when did this practice originate? The story of relics in Egypt begins much further back in time. Long before Christianity, the ancient Egyptians used preserved dead bodies to create conduits to their gods. But these relics weren't human remains. Just 20 miles outside of Cairo is an ancient burial complex with a network of underground tunnels, the sacred animal necropolis. The tunnels here once housed over half a million animal mummies, the preserved flesh and bone of ibis birds, falcons, and baboons. I'm an Egyptologist, but I'm not a specialist in animal mummies. So I've invited my good friend, Dr. Salima Ikram, to help me explore the necropolis. She spent most of her academic life trying to figure out why and how the ancient Egyptians preserved the corpses of animals. We've asked the authorities to open up the baboon necropolis. It's been sealed off to protect it from looters. Because no one has set foot inside these tunnels since the Egypt Exploration Society dug here over 15 years ago, this isn't just exciting for me, it's a privilege. And even though tombs like this are unbelievably hot and dirty, any Egyptologist would jump at a chance to go into a dark hole in the ground, especially one filled with mummies. Ancient Egyptian priests bred, killed, and mummified thousands of animals and sold them to worshippers who dedicated the mummies to their gods. The animals were then stored on these little shelves. Look at this. Okay, this is very cool. Can you see this, Kara? Is this, this the skin of the baboon? No, no. What is this that? is actually all plaster because they would mummify the baboon yeah. and then set him in plaster. Each baboon is not only mummified, but encased in a coffin and then placed into one of these niches. Yeah, so each niche was for a single baboon burial. Don't f hit your head. Look at this. It's this is the baboon mummy in yes, here? Yes, that's the baboon mummy. Each mummified animal was connected to the power of a particular god. Baboons were believed to be incarnations of the god Thoth, god of writing and magical spells. Every preserved corpse was believed to magically act for its owner. And presumably, the more a pilgrim spent on an animal mummy, the better the return he expected on his investment. 
Baboons weren't the only animals that were mummified. No. Right? We have lots of other different kinds yeah. of animals. You've got ibises, you've got different kind of falcons. They're dogs, they're cats. And there are some places where you even had the eggs of crocodiles as well as the crocodiles themselves. Pilgrims would come, they would buy a mummy, and then this mummy would be put into these catacombs to take the prayer of the pilgrim to the gods forever and ever. It's a way of encasing the sacred because they're representative of gods. Yeah. If you send that god off to the next world, mm -hmm. off to the beyond, with your prayer, then it's a speedy, super way of making it's, sure you get what it it's is It's express you want. mail. So if you define a relic as something that encases the sacred, yeah. in flesh and bone. In you know? flesh and bone, you couldn't do better than an animal mummy. The ancient Egyptians believed that the systematic slaughter of these animals and the preservation of their bodies connected them to the power of their gods. But what happens when the sacred body isn't an animal, but a human? Halfway around the world from Egypt lies Lima, Peru. Lima was founded in 1535 as a Christian capital of the New World. The sacred animal necropolis would have seemed like a heathen practice to the founders of this city. For them, relics could only be humans, thought to have been touched by God. This is the house of Santa Rosa, who was born here in Lima, Peru in 1586. She was an ascetic, which meant that she not only denied herself comfort in the name of God, but she actually created discomfort for herself. Santa Rosa wanted to be as close to God as possible. And one of the ways that she did this was through pain. She wore a spiked crown of thorns made of metal on her head. And she would actually put lye on her face, which ate away at her flesh. This dedication to God was so amazing that people believed she was in direct contact with the heavens because she wanted to take on the sufferings of Jesus Christ. Santa Rosa believed she needed to take herself out of the world, and one way of doing that was building this hut, which she lived in for several years, rarely leaving it. To enter the hut, she had to actually crawl through on her hands and knees, gave her some humility. And to communicate with her, visitors spoke through a grate in the wall. Not long after Santa Rosa's death, the people of Lima actually dug her body up. This may seem strange and macabre, but really it's a way of bringing her sacred presence back into the world of the living. Her relics are prominently displayed at Santo Domingo, a nearby church. Rosa's contemporaries believe she was so pure and holy that they enshrined her head in this elaborate altar, wearing a crown of roses. Catholics believed she was touched by the Holy Spirit and that this head contains that sacred power. This is very different from the ancient Egyptians who believed that divine power could be contained in the mummified body of an animal. For Christians, when the Holy Spirit exists on earth, it can only touch human bodies. When saints died, they left only one body. This precious commodity was sometimes fought over by worshipers, and the bodies were often ripped apart, scattering gruesome, disembodied relics all across the Christian world. A finger in this church, a saint's head in another. Because of their rarity, these sacred body parts were treasured items. Next, the story of a saint who paid a horrific price for her faith and a crypt nearly beyond belief. Look at this. It's just okay. bones and bones and bones of everybody. It's amazing. Today, the Vatican in Rome is the center of the Catholic Church. But in the second century, most Romans worship many gods, and Christianity was a forbidden religion. During this time, one of the first Christian saints paid a gruesome price for her beliefs. This 9th century church holds the remains of Saint Cecilia, whose body is enshrined in a crypt beneath the central altar. 
St. Cecilia has a compelling story. Catholics tell us that in the year 117, she was killed by the Romans because she refused to worship in the emperor's cult. They also say that when her tomb was opened in 1599, over a thousand years later, her body was found to be perfectly preserved or incorrupt, the sign of a saint. Pilgrims come from all over the world to be in St. Cecilia's physical presence. Because for the faithful, the miraculous survival of her body confirms the very existence of God. Beneath the altar of the church, an ancient Roman house still survives. A house that many Catholics believe was Cecilia's. This is what I love about Rome. If you go underneath the street level, you're in ancient Rome. You're walking on the ancient streets and you have ancient buildings on either side. Cecilia belonged to what the Romans considered a cult. She was a Christian. And because she was a Christian, she wouldn't give any gifts to the emperor. Because of that, she had to die. So soldiers came to her home and locked her into a caldarium, which is a really hot Roman sauna. They expected that the intense heat and lack of air would eventually suffocate her. But Cecilia refused to die. When the soldiers returned three days later to collect her body, they were surprised to find her still alive. So they dragged her from the caldarium and finished her off with three hacking blows to the neck. In this statue depicting the way that they found her, they didn't try to hide how gruesome her execution was. You can actually see three cut marks in her neck and the blood coming out. Christianity eventually became the dominant religion in Rome. And unlike St. Cecilia, believers didn't have to hide their faith or risk persecution. Christianity evolved and split into different denominations. Roman Catholic worshipers came to embrace not only saints, but in the case of one order, the remains of all those who had committed their lives to devotion. This is the Church of Santa Maria Immaculata Concezione in Rome. Above ground, it seems like a typical 17th century Italian church. But underground lies something extraordinary. Father Rinaldo is a Capuchin monk and caretaker of the crypt. We are in the church of the Capuchin monks. Only Capuchin monks were buried here. This is why only Capuchin monks were allowed inside. No outsiders. It's always meant to be closed. It's always meant to be exclusive. Oh, yes. yes? Father Rinaldo was gracious enough to grant me a private tour of the crypt, a place which contains the bodies of thousands of monks in an extraordinary display. It's just okay. bones and bones and bones of everybody. Skulls, arm bones, leg bones. It's nearly impossible to explain the feeling you get when you first lay eyes on the crypt walls. There are about 3,500 monks buried here. And some are still in the ground. And some are yeah. in their yeah. alcoves. And some are standing up. That's amazing. To the Capuchin order, these aren't exactly relics, but physical reminders of what's to come. I expected it to be gruesome and creepy, but it truly is awe-inspiring. What was it intended to mean? The idea of those who made this decoration is to make a hymn, not to death, but to life. Death is not an enemy, it's a sister. So they're showing you the, the wonder and miraculousness of death. This is not macabre. It's beautiful. Even though these remains are not strictly relics, they serve a similar purpose. Capuchin monks come down to the crypt for guidance. Their proximity to the bones of the dead 
renews their faith in the kingdom of God. So these bones, they don't really have a power of their own, right? But they're meant to communicate something? Your time on earth is quick and brief. Therefore, the message is to not remain attached to the bones that are here or to this life. Despite suffering, despite pain and death, there is the hope of a life that does not end here.